Lowell, and welcome to Undercover. This is the show that looks between the covers of books by Missoula area authors. My name is Dave Polly. I'm director of the Missoula Public Library, and this is a show that's jointly produced by the library and by Fact and Fiction, Fiction Bookstore. And our guest tonight is our first encore guest on Undercover, Dick Manning. Welcome, Dick, and thanks for being here again. Thank you, Dave. It's good to be here. The first time uh, we had you on the show, we talked about your book, Last Stand, and your new book is called A Good House, Building a Life on the Land. And it's a book about, uh, about your building your own house, and along with your wife, Tracy, and friends and the other people who were involved in the whole experience. I was wondering if you had in mind writing about it even before you started the whole project, or, or how did that come together? Well, they kind of came together at the same time, actually. I'd been thinking about building a house for a very long time. It's the kind of same kind of thing that always perks in the back of one's head you know, over the years. But when I got serious about it, I was also looking around for a book project. And so one kind of fed off the other to the point that they said, well, why not? And mm -hmm. so that's how it worked. Mm -hmm. And I guess you talked about, um, in the book you talked about a certain things coming together in your life at, at this juncture and, and that motivated you toward, toward the building of the house. Mm -hmm. But you also, um, it seems to me like it was a, took a certain amount of courage to go into this because you've had some experience in building. I mean, you know what you're doing with tools and carpentry, but you're not a builder yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you feel a sense of fear or trepidation going into this? Oh, party? it's an incredibly intimidating thing to see that hole in the ground the first time and you know mm -hmm. that it's up to you to fill it up with concrete and boards to the point it reaches a house. It's something I'd never done before. I'd remodeled a number of houses. Um, you know, I was a pretty good weekend carpenter, but never even put it all together. To um, When I got in trouble, I simply got help, but yeah, it was intimidating. And it isn't just the building. There were some uh, preliminary things you had to go through. I guess that everybody does when they do this. Sure. Title searches, real estate problems. Yeah. And in fact, a lot of frustration in that, in that preliminary stuff, wasn't there? Yeah, that was one of the more eye-opening aspects of the entire project. And then uh, I had worked as a reporter for most of my life. And so I was real comfortable with a, a paper world. Uh, the world of bureaucrats and the world of uh, inspectors and that sort of thing. And I thought I could negotiate that pretty well. And I'd also um, uh, grown to trust these people as a reporter, and I'd listened to the developers over the years complain about them and say, you know, that that was unnecessary burden on their enterprise. Uh, and once I became a builder and actually tried to do something, it was seeing that world from a different side, and it was, it was pretty eye-opening. Evidently, this, the ownership of the land you bought was pretty ambiguous? or Oh, that's, that's pretty common in Montana right now. The way um, land's been subdivided and ranches mm -hmm. have been split up, uh, there are layers of ownership and land contracts and, and all sorts of messes out there. And I, I encountered kind of minor messes as I went along and actually found it pretty funny toward the end, but it was pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. And you, and this book isn't just about building your own house, but it's, no. it's also about the way we build houses, the way we choose to live. In fact, you said that, I'm quoting you here, you said, we're, distance fr we're distanced from our surroundings. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, how, how you conceived this project so that you would be a little bit less distanced than just the most of us are. I guess. I tried to know about my house. Um, uh, what really brought me to the project in the first place was a sort of environmentalism. That um, I'd covered the timber industry in Montana for a long time. I understood there were clear cuts out there. And a lot of people understand that, but no one really explores the idea of why those clear cuts are there. In other words, people are buying the lumber and they're building houses. And people live in houses every day. Are there ways that we can build our houses that would make those clear cuts smaller, or there would be fewer of them, and be fewer demands on our resources in general? And so I had tried to explore the implications of those ideas to see how my house was connected to the region through its economy. I also wanted to see how my house was connected to its particular piece of land. And so I investigated the grasses and the trees that grew there, the sorts of species, and I wanted to make it a part of that as well, and really pretty true to its landscape. So there are kind of two aspects to that. And then there's also a number of other issues, uh, including the whole issue of 
water and how, how we get water mm -hmm. to houses, especially in Montana where water is a rather rare commodity. And, and you had a, a experience of bringing in a, a well witcher yeah, to find well, your well. Oh, you absolutely. You talk about that a little. I mean, did you believe in that sort of thing when you got this guy to come? Or? I don't know if I believed in it or not. I, I had seen it done before a lot. I, when I was a kid, especially going through college, I worked on construction crews, and there were these guys who could find buried pipes with two pieces of wire. And I'd seen that done a number of times, and I don't know if they're putting me on or not, but I said, well, it's worth a try. It won't cost that much. And so um, and a lot of the building industry is based on hearsay. In other words, um, you, you ask around to see who does mm -hmm. a particular thing. And that's what I did. I asked around, and I found a witch. And this guy drove out to my property one afternoon, and he got out his wires and his big old stick. He had kind of a shillelagh, and he went around, and he claimed to find water. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It was, it was one of those stories. You know, you, you, it's kind of build houses for the stories you can tell, and it was one of the stories yeah. I got out of the deal. It turns out you didn't have to drill an extremely deep well. No. And you thought that might have been necessary. Sure. Yeah, in fact, he did find water. It just wasn't the depth he said it would be. He claimed he could find it within a few feet, but we found water at not too bad of a distance at all. Mm -hmm. But again, that, that brings up the whole issue of uh, how we use water in, in, in our whole society, not just Montana, but you, you mentioned that some places in Montana people are drilling 700 feet to get water. Yeah, 500 at least that I know of, and then there are other places, especially in the West. The West is arid, and it's going to be one of our biggest problems. Um, even further away in the, the southern plains, we're depleting the Oglala Aquifer right now. The city of Phoenix is sinking because we're pumping the water out. And that's something we hardly ever think about when we build a house, but it's true. Uh, we use enormous amounts of water in our house, and we really don't need to. There are all sorts of ways around that, and that's just one of the investigations. And you wrote extensively about some of the different ways that you had hoped to um, build a house that used less water than mm -hmm. what we normally think we need. Sure. In fact, you quoted a figure in there, I can't remember what it was, of the gallons of water per person that we yeah, tend I, to use. Yeah, I think it's, if I remember, I have terrible memory for numbers, but I think it's about 400, a third of which, yeah. a third of the, of of the average ha water usage in a house is the toilet, right. flushing the toilet. And right. that's completely unnecessary in a lot of different ways, so mm -hmm. things like that. Um, there are also ways to recycle water, for instance, and so you don't, or to um, forego a certain amount of landscaping. And you know, we tend to pump a lot of water on grasses that aren't supposed to live in the West, and right. things like that. Yes. Well, you also said that, um, that this whole and I'm quoting you again, you said it, the, the building was a process ruled by error, and you did install a, a composting toilet, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons, of course, for those is, is one of the reasons is to save water, but that proved to be not quite as straightforward as you thought. I wonder <laughs> if you could talk about what happened there. Not at all. Um, it was more experiment than anything, but we ordered a composting toilet, and installed the thing, and mostly as a way to save water, as you pointed out, but also we wanted to recycle our waste into the ground. And um, it didn't perform as advertised, and so that created a few headaches, as you might imagine. Um, those sorts of things can be pretty catastrophic. But I learned a lot about that. It's a biological process, as in the digestion of waste, the composting is a biological process, and those aren't very predictable, and they take some getting used to and some accepting some responsibility for your errors. In that case, it was a huge responsibility, but it worked out in the end. And you also talked about how we the standard house that you see built, say, in one of the subdivisions around here, is, has gotten a lot larger over the years. Yeah. Yeah. There, you know, I don't do a lot of prescriptions in the book. I don't try to tell people how to build their houses um, because that's so dependent on local solutions, local materials, and your own values. The one I will do is to say, build your house smaller. Our houses are far, far too large. The um, median house in the United States is about 2,000 square feet now. Um, that's up 20% in the last oh, six or seven years. Um, I can't believe our houses were that cramped six or seven years ago that we had to increase them by 20%. Um, now that median figure is more than double the median Japanese house, for instance. Mm -hmm. But here around Missoula, we're seeing that figure even stretched. So I heard yesterday of a house that is 8,000 square feet in Missoula, and I heard of one house that is 13,000, I'm sorry, yeah, 8,000 square feet, and one that is 13,000 square feet for two people in Missoula. And I think there ought to be a special spot in hell for people who build houses like that. 
So what's the reason for that? You, you alluded to a number of times our, our appetite. Uh, is that just what's happening as we get a bigger and bigger appetite for more stuff? Or? Well, it's, it's kind of a notion of quality, I think, in some ways, is that we all want a quality to our lives, especially in our houses. I mean, a house is a very important thing. And so it ought to be something you enjoy to some extent. And somehow along the way in American culture, we became convinced that bigger is better. And I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Uh, look what happened in the auto industry, for instance, with bigger cars, and we became convinced that bigger was not better. But I think that, to, that we have to get over that idea if we're ever to have any resources left, if we're ever going to stop the clear cutting of our hills. And we're going to have to learn to get by with limits in this country. Aren't there some factors that make that sort of a vision difficult to realize? I mean, uh, how do we, I know you didn't really preach about it, but I think it, the message came through that you would like to see developers and builders think about some of these things. And how do we make that happen? I think developers and builders do think about it to a great extent. They would like to experiment with some of the more efficient houses. Um, I think it's the buying public that's demanding the big houses, you know, and we're all complicit in this to some degree or another. Um, I think one of the biggest problems is we've lost our feedback loops. And so we don't understand that when we build a large house, we are directly involved in the clear cutting of a forest. We're the ones who ordered up the lumber that caused that to be clear cut in the first place. We don't see the connection. That's our feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to reinforce in some way, make people conscious of what's going on there when they make a decision to consume. And a house is one of our biggest cons decisions to consume. Yes, and so, and so our consumption, we don't see the results of that. No, very not easy. at all. And I think our values are pretty good in a lot of cases. Of, people really wouldn't do that if they knew the kind of damage they're, they're mm -hmm. causing. Um, in a lot of cases, in some cases they would, but we have to do what we can to, to improve that. And you also seem to feel pretty strongly that the participation of the people in the building made a, a better connection yeah. in that sense. Yeah, I'm one of these people that likes to tinker with my own life all the time and know what's going on. I like to grow my own food, for instance. I like to fix my own car and play my own music just because I find that more rewarding. And so in the end, um, when I've participated in my house to the level that I've participated, I feel more attached to it. It's more a part of me. Um, the reward of that really came, comes late in the process. Now living in it, that's part of the reward. But when people come to, to the house, they'll say to my wife and I, my, this house looks like you. you know, and that, that to me is, a, is an enormous compliment of what we put into the house because it does, it feels like us. And it feels like our life. And it's because we were so intensely involved in the making of it. It was the testing of our values in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But you also had to work with certain um, experts in areas where you didn't feel comfortable. You had to call in people to do the sheet rocking mm -hmm. and, and to, although you helped with the concrete and that. Yeah. So it, it wasn't just you doing everything yourself. No, not at all. Not at all. There were other people involved. And that was that was so much fun. That was the best part of the project is meeting up all those people who, who are in the building trades. I, I was just the level of commitment and intelligence was just enormous in those people and so I had a great time working with them and, and, and I learned a lot from them and that was also part of the process of that learning experience that goes with it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, the, the house that you built and the way you describe it, it's more than a house. It's uh, kind of a symbol of a lot of different things in your own life. Uh, yeah. uh, I wonder if you could talk about some of your feelings that went into the building specifically on that? I tend to believe that the, the kinds of psychic and spiritual issues that we're interested in aren't really that separate from the physical. And so the idea of connecting my life to the earth is more than an idea to me. And so if I look at a house, it really is the physical connection of my life to the earth. In so many ways, all the materials flow out of the earth, but also there it is. That's what allows me to survive on the earth. That's what I live in on top of the earth. And so be, by exploring those connections, I was able to explore the fuller, fuller meaning of my life 
and how it relates to nature and that ultimately was what the project was about. It was a house set in nature, the context of nature, and I wanted it to be really attentive to that context and mm -hmm. understand it fully. But most of us aren't, I'm afraid. I mean, N well, is there, are there anything that we can do to uh, get a little bit more in touch with that context? Those oh, of us I, who live in a subdivision or in the city? Or? I think people are to a degree, and I think that once you start that process, it becomes so rewarding that you'll automatically follow through in it. You can do some very easy things. You can walk out in your backyard and learn the name of the first bird you happen to encounter. I mean, that's what begins the process, and pretty soon you start asking the questions of where that bird comes from, where my water comes from, or where any clean air comes from. Mm -hmm. And you start tracing those connections back, and you'll find out that you're integrated in that, too. It's just that some of us just simply don't take the time to sit down and figure that out, the time for contemplation, and that's, that's really the luxury I was afforded in this building process. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you did, I, now I recall you wrote about somebody living in a Winnebago in the desert or something, and feeding yeah. the birds but not even knowing which birds they were, what that's the right. name of the mountain range was that they yeah. saw off in the distance. Yeah, yeah, that was a really important experience for me. And coming back from, I was on a magazine assignment when that happened, and I, and I described flying back into Missoula. Mm -hmm. And I was on, on the plane on a weekend with a plane load of a Montanans. And I could tell they were Montanans because they were all going to the windows and naming the mountains as they flew by. And that, mm -hmm. that to me was a, just a wonderful indication of what a special place we live in. And the potential is there for us to begin that process of reconnecting simply by learning the names, learning our place. And the house for me was a vehicle for that, just another way of learning. It was a field guide to my place in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, toward the end of the book, you got a little, uh, you shared a little bit of concern about what this book was going to mean to different readers. In mm -hmm. fact, I think you had some trepidation about the whole idea of a lot of people reading this deciding they're going to come build a house in Montana because it sounds so great. Yeah. Do you still feel that sense of concern? Yeah. Yeah, and that's something I know I'm going to fight with uh, in the writing of the book or did fight with in the writing of the book and now in talking about the book with other people, especially as I go into urban areas, for instance. Because I know so many people will read that and they won't understand the cost. And I don't mean the cost in dollars, and that's the sort of thing that comes so easily to urban people who are moving here now. It says, oh, that's all that cost, here's the check. I mean the cost in, in, in the hardships and the work, the labor that brings out and makes that experience rewarding. That house is not just a product that one can consume, one can go buy. That house is a living of that house at the same time. And I'm, I'm afraid so few people will understand that, and they'll try to replicate it, and when they do, they'll end up destroying what they set out to make. Mm -hmm. I, I want to specifically ask you a couple of questions that interested me. One is you talked about heating water and how the water heaters that, I wasn't really aware of this, I guess, the water heaters that we use are really inefficient because they have to, it's like leaving your car running all the time in mm -hmm. case you want to go somewhere. Yeah and that most of the, the way water is heated in Europe, for example, are these on-demand, which is the kind that you got for your house. Right. How come we don't sell those in this country? Or, I mean, it's hard to get them, I guess. It's tradition. It's habit. It's uh, what people are used to installing. Um, you're used to asking for hot water. And when the hot water comes out of the tap, then you're satisfied as a consumer. And that's what, the way most people operate. And so the people in building trades give you what you want, hot water. Um, and you don't ask the larger questions how that's made, and nor do the people installing it. They go with what's safe because they want to satisfy your demands, what's available, what's cheap. Mm -hmm. um, I just tried to explore around that process. And hot water heaters work now with a, a large tank, and the tank of you know, 50, 70 gallons, and that water's hot all the time. And so there's an energy cost in keeping that hot. Mine works when you turn on the tap, a bunch of gas jets come on and heat the water instantly so there's no water stored hot. Um, the advantage of that is I have a virtually unlimited supply of hot water, but the real advantage is my energy costs are decreased by about 75, no, more than that, they're about 25 percent of what you would normally have for, for heating your hot water, at no cost to me. I mean, no cost in terms of my comfort. I have just as much hot water as I want, and that's the kind of solution I try to pursue, kind of a low-tech solution through there. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about the use of electricity and power and how and I grew up in the Northwest. I know that cheap, we had uh, electric heaters in my house when I was a kid. There is, 
a tremendous amount of cheap power here, but we, we are paying a price for that, and you, you've mentioned that, that there is a price. Yeah, uh, our, the biggest price here in the Northwest is the death of the salmon. And where most of our power, at least where I live in the, on the cooperative, is hydroelectrically generated. Here in Missoula, it's generated by coal. But that's an enormous cost as far as I'm concerned, the death of a species. And we ought to think about ways that we can circumvent that cost, or at least ameliorate it in some sense. And it turns out it's not that hard. Um, the devices exist. Um, one of the things I used in my house were uh, the collection of compact fluorescent light bulbs. You know, they look like a normal light bulb. They're slightly larger. Um, they're available locally now. You can go down to any of the hardware stores and buy them. Uh, they cost quite a bit of money. They cost about $15, but they last about 10 times as long as a normal light bulb, and they use about a quarter of the energy. And so over the life of that light bulb, it puts about $30 back into your pocket as opposed to using a conventional light bulb. Well, no one really thinks about that, though. When you, when you burn out a light bulb, you just screw into the replacement of that. If, we would, if every house in America would convert to those light bulbs, we could be an energy exporting nation instantly. Amazing. The technology's there. The market's there. It's all in place. We just haven't thought about it that much as consumers. Uh, the power of a consumer is enormous. And no one's going to infringe on that at all. The government is not going to tell you what you can or can't buy, except in very extreme cases. And so we ought to exercise our power as consumers and go out and buy those things that are responsible, not just to our immediate needs, but to the broader needs of the environment and to our society. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if we could talk just a little bit. You mentioned you were going on tour mm -hmm. with a book, and where are you going to be going? Well, I'll, I'm starting out with a tour of Seattle, Portland, and Spokane, so Northwest, and Northwest is a lot like Missoula. It's interesting. It's book-reading territory, and mm -hmm. so I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest. And then probably Denver after that, so touring about with it. Was this book uh, difficult to get accepted by your publisher? or No, it actually sold fairly fast. I, I was surprised. Um, it was a new publisher over my last book. I'm with Grove this time with this project, and um, we had quite a bit of interest. Grove just happened to be more interested than anyone else and ended up with a contract. But they loved the idea and jumped at it in a hurry. I was surprised. I thought with a scam like that, it'd take me forever to sell it, but it worked very rapidly. <laughs> was it considered to be by the publisher of just of regional interest? Or no. I know it's been reviewed in national publications. We yeah, they're hoping there will be a great deal of national, national interest in it, just because it's a common dream. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, right. it's, it, it begins about being a book about Montana, but the, the, the dream of a house belongs to almost everyone in the country. Sure. And so this is a way that the American dream needs to be refocused on a little bit. Mm -hmm. I want to show, a, if I could, a, one of the photographs from the book. With a, there's a series of photographs in the, in the middle at some of the construction, various stages, and then we have the, the uh, final product here. I want to get a, I wonder if we could get a shot of that. And that's the house. My friend Michael Gallagher worked very hard to get that photograph. He actually stood on top of a 12-foot stepladder at peril to his body and soul, probably, mm -hmm. but managed that photo. I'm glad they put that in. Yeah, it's a nice, yeah, well. a nice picture. I guess I wanted to ask you how everything is working out in the house. Are you Real well. Uh, we enjoy it a great deal. Um, there, there are things that, we, uh, that I would change if I were doing it again, but by and large, it's what I expected, and uh, I love living there. Uh, do you think you're going to have interest from a lot of people wanting to see your house after this book comes out, especially right around here? I've had some of that so far, and even a grade school class wanted to, uh, <laughs> wanted to come out and tour. tour. I said, sure, come on out. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to limit that after a while because people keep <laughs> wanting to see it. We get too many. We'll have lines of people. Right. Well, thanks a lot for being our guest again, our first Encore guest. And the name of the book is A Good House. The author is Dick Manning and you'll want to pick this up at your local bookstore or library real soon. I want to take a couple of minutes to do my library promo. First of all, I'd like to say that, to let everyone know that the library has just received an award as Montana's Library of the Year. The Montana Library Association each year picks out a librarian and a library to receive this award. Missoula Public Library is the Montana Library of the Year, and we're very proud of that. And I think uh, some thank yous are in order. I'd like to just express my thanks to the staff and the board and, and the public in Missoula who have been real supportive of the library and 
those are the people that have made us the Library of the Year, and we're going to work real hard to live up to, uh, to that award. I'd like to talk about the summer reading program, which starts up in June. This is a tradition we have been carrying on for many, many years. The reason we do this is because all the research that we know of shows that kids who read over the summer retain their reading skills uh, from one end of school to the beginning of the next year. And that's really important because reading is the bedrock skill for all other academic skills. And so we encourage all children, and this year everybody, to participate. The theme this year is Many Faces, Many Places. So we'll be having lots of uh, varied uh, programs about cultures around the world and here in, in the United States. And we're encouraging everybody to be involved in the reading program this year, not just kids, but adults also can keep track of what they're reading for the summer. I also want to uh, mention one other program that is an ongoing and very successful program at the Missoula Public Library, which is Book Babies, which happens the first Wednesday of every month at 7 o'clock. As far as I know, we're the only library in Montana that's doing a program like this. We uh, invite parents of infants up to two years to come into the library with their children at 7 o'clock the first Wednesday, and we have a little program for the kids. Now, you might think that kids that young can't uh, appreciate or sit still for a story or program, but they can, actually. And then we also, part of that half hour is devoted to um, some kind of a presentation for the parents about uh, finding a good daycare center or how to deal with certain problems with your infants. So we're real proud of that program. I think it's real innovative and uh, want to encourage people to bring down their babies to that program. Also want to remind people that we are open six days a week, four evenings, Monday through Thursday, 10 in the morning until 9 in the evening, and Friday and Saturday, 10 until 6. Uh, it still seems like some people don't have a good grasp of what our hours are. We keep those hours regular the year round, so we don't close on Saturdays in the summer anymore. And uh, we especially appreciate comments that people have about our services. If they want to talk to me or to any staff member, just uh, you can do that formally through a little written form we have, or you can do it informally by just coming in and chatting with us about improvements you'd like to see made. And one last thing, if you live on the south side of Missoula or down the Bitterroot and you don't uh, have occasion to get to the library to return your materials sometimes, you can now return them at a book drop on the south side, which is located at Kmart, right in the walkway between Kmart and Safeway. And we will pick those up once a day to make sure that we don't uh, dun anybody for overdue materials in there. So, Again, thanks, Dick Manning, for being our guest on Undercover.